So we're going to switch gears a little bit here. So far for this whole course, we have more or less focused on having one sample from the same population. In this case, though, what we're going to take a look at is what happens if we have two samples and we want to test, right? We're not sure, hey, these two samples, we didn't necessarily sample them. We're not too sure. We want to conduct a test and kind of figure out, are these two samples likely from the same population or do we have evidence to suggest that maybe they're from different populations? So in that case there, right, think about this. You have a sample mean of incomes from one group. You have a sample mean of incomes from another group. You want to say, hey, I have a difference between these two sample means. Am I just sampling two different populations? A is one of them accountants. The other one is a bunch of people in marketing. Or did I just sample across the board just accountants and it's the difference in my two sample means is just due to sampling error. So that's what we're going to be taking a look at as we move through this video. Uh, in specific, what are our outcomes that we're hoping for? So first thing we want to do is we want to be able to actually conduct our five step for hypothesis testing for a few different cases. First, we're going to be taking a look at conducting those five steps to determine a difference in population means. Hey, is this population mean likely different than that population mean? We have two different scenarios to look at with this. We have one scenario where our presumed standard deviations are known. That is, we believe we know that true population standard deviation. On the other hand, we'll have the case when we presume that those population standard deviations are unknown, which, right, to be honest, is typically the case we're going to be working with. We're then going to be carrying forward and we're going to be doing the same thing with proportions. So, hey, we have two sample proportions. Uh, we have 10% of voters in this area supported a current uh, politician, while 15% in this one supported a current politician. Is that actually different? Are these two different groups, or is that just sampling difference between the two? So we'll take a look at those two there. We'll wrap up by taking a look at the difference between a dependent and an independent sample, and we'll take a look at how to conduct our hypothesis test if we have dependent samples as well. So a few different things to take a look at as we move through. The way this video is going to look, I'm going to introduce the statistics. So again, we'll go through our five steps of hypothesis testing just to refresh ourselves. I'll kind of highlight the differences between our one sample versus two sample worlds. Really, the big change is going to be in step one, step three. Step three is where we're going to be seeing the most action. That's in this video really where we're going to introduce things. In a follow-up video, It'll just be all examples. So we're not going to get too much into the calculations here. We're not going to get too much into actually working through things. We're going to introduce it. We're going to talk about the theory. We're going to say, hey, yeah, this is the formula we will use. And then we'll leave it here. In the next video, that's where, that's where we'll begin to actually play around with it, where we'll begin to actually use it as we go through. So make sure you watch both of those videos. Make sure you get access to both so that you have both the theory and the application. Okay, let's move on and let's talk about what exactly is going on with these two sample hypothesis tests. And to be clear, to start off, we are dealing with independent samples. I, I should really preface, right? We've already done one, and you're like, okay, let's just get to it, Keith. No, 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 let me preface. Uh, what we're going to do is we've already taken a look at one sample. Here we're doing two sample. These hypothesis tests are identical. The five steps stay the same. And that's really the big thing. If you carry on at all in statistics, if you go on to Biz 231, if you go on to other statistics courses, hypothesis testing is the one common thread that you will always be using. It's the one common theme in every stats course. It is the fundamental skill like reading or writing. You'll introduce new statistics. You'll introduce new uh, distributions, uh, new, uh, right, instead of our normal distribution or students T distribution, you'll witness the chi distribution or many, many others. That's just all different distributions. The basis as to what you're doing with them, the hypothesis testing, that remains the same. So this really is the biggest skill to get out of this course. Okay, now that being said, let's go take a look at an example. And let's work through this, right? And this example is just kind of to set our stage. So here we go. So let's suppose that we wanted to test if there was a difference, right? So we want to test, is there a difference in survival 
between two popular tire brands. So, okay, we have two different popular tire brands, and we'll say that they, res they have, for each respective brand, we go and we pull out a sample from one of 15 tires. We pull out a sample from brand two of 20 tires, and we obtain the following. We obtain a sample mean. So, okay, on average, tire one ends up lasting 475,000 K until the tire was done. And tire brand two, on average, lasted 481. 1000k before it died right before it was expanded before we used too much of the tire for it to be safe to utilize now here we're going to say that hey the manufacturer has given us some kind of information that is the manufacturer has said okay standard deviation of tire brand one is known to be 10,000k similarly tire brand two is a known standard deviation of 13 Okay, so really what we're wanting to look at here is we want to say hey, well, okay, right right up here at the start Is there a difference in survivability between these two popular tire brands? So that is hey does one tire brand on average last longer than the other if we were just to take a look at our samples here Taking a look at our samples. It appears that tire brand 2 lasts longer than tire brand 1 right 481 versus 475 what we need to determine though is hey is this difference just sampling error or is this difference actually vast enough to suggest that we have an actual difference in survivability uh, we have to make an assumption working through this question right and i didn't state this as we worked through it but it is in the question that i'm reading this from and that would be that it is presumed that both tire brands come from a symmetric distribution Right, and that is important because we have a sample size of 15 and a sample size of 20. So that is in order to be able to presume that X bar one and X bar two are both normally distributed around mean standard deviation root N around normally distributed around the mean two standard deviation root N. In order to make this assumption, we need to appeal to the central limit theorem. In order to appeal to the central limit theorem, we need to have our correct assumptions, right? So sample size greater than 30 if we know nothing, sample size greater than 10 if the true population distribution is symmetric, and population, or sorry, sample size greater than three if our population is itself normal. So we need to have that symmetric assumption or statement showing up as well. Okay, so working through our five steps of hypothesis tests, let's just write them down and let's kind of fill in how we would work through this. So step one. Step one is stating our null versus our alternative. Alternative. What we're used to, what we're used to when we're dealing with the one sample situation was to say, hey, uh, null alternative saying something like, okay, mu one is different than some number, right? So in this case here, we could say, hey, mu one is different from 481,000, our best kind of guess as to what mu two is, versus our null statement, which would then do say, no, 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 mu one is actually the same as 481,000. Uh, we would actually have a problem if we did it this way in the sense here, right? Why why do we start off with mu1, right? And do we actually know that this is a good sample of mu2? It's probably the best sample we have, the best kind of insight as to what mu2 would be, but uh, is that actually really what we're looking at? Well, no, this isn't really what we're looking at. So let's let's back up. Let's back up here. What we're actually going to be looking at in this case here 
is we're in this two sample world and we're really saying, hey, is there a difference in the survivability between these two popular tire brands? That is, I'm asking, is mu1, the average survivability of tire brand one, equal to or not equal to, in this case, any different than the average survivability of tire brand two? My null then, my null hypothesis would be that the two are actually one and the same. That is that mu1 equals mu2. So in this case here, in my two sample hypothesis test world, I'm always gonna to want to set my hypothesis tests as one population parameter equal to another population parameter, right? Mu1 equal to mu2. Or alternatively, right, we could be asking the question if this was phrased a little bit differently. Let's say, hey, is there evidence that brand two lasts longer? Well, if I was asking that, is there evidence that brand two lasts longer? I would phrase it as this, that hey, mu one is less than mu two, and versus my null statement, whoa, what happened there? Versus my null statement that mu one is greater than or equal to mu two. So everything in our two sample world isn't just, hey, mu one to some number, but population parameter to population parameter. That's what we're taking a look at in this case. Okay, let's get rid of this yellow bit. It's not part of our question. That was just an example as to another situation we could be looking at. Step two. Uh, step two, let's suppose that we want to test this at the 5% significance level. So we'll set alpha equal to 5%. Keep in mind, 5% significance level, that's just saying how much we're going to put into each tail. We're going to say, yeah, yeah, we're going to put 5% into that rejection region. So, okay, 5% is in our rejection region. This is hinting at a two-tailed test. So we would be putting half of that on each one. So, again, just to kind of have some thought as to what's going on as we get through this. Step three. Okay, step three, this is where we need to introduce something new. And that new thing we need to introduce is <coughs> is our new test statistic. So that is, so far, what have we had that's different? We've had a different way of stating our null and our, and our alternative. That's fine, that's not too crazy. In fact, in some ways, this is going to be easier. Mu1, mu2, mu1, mu2, right? We don't have to state with respect to some number. Number three, well, for number three here, we're going to have to introduce a new value. And the way that we're going to do this is really, I want to go back to step one and kind of think about how we want to perform this test, right? And that is, if we want to think about how we want to perform this test, well, really, am I asking, hey, mu1 equals... Wait a minute, I don't even know what these values are. How am I going to set what mu1 is equal to? What mu how do I take this information to help this? Seems like I have a bit of a problem. We can rectify this, we can solve this, we can make this problem go away with a little bit of algebra. And that is what I can do is I can take this and direction doesn't really matter. I can go and I can express this null, I can express this alternative differently. I can just do a little bit of algebra. I can go, hey, mu1 minus mu2 equals zero. My alternative then would be that mu1 minus mu2 does not equal zero. Now, okay, keep in mind the way that I just did this, I chose to do mu1 minus mu2. I very easily could have done this a different way. I very easily could have, let's just go and extend this out farther again. I could have done, hey, zero equals mu2 minus mu1 versus my alternative that mu2 minus mu1 does not equal zero. So the order does not matter. However, it is important that whichever order you choose to state your null, whichever order you use to state your alternative, that you keep this constant throughout. That is, if you went mu1 minus mu2, you need to maintain that ordering of 1 minus 2 throughout the whole question. 
That is ultimately, we're going to simplify this null. We're going to simplify this alternative to be delta mu equals zero versus my alternative that delta mu does not equal zero. So that's really how we can simplify this in that sense there. And now, now we have some value, some number. That is, we can do something to work this out. So let's go through and do that. I'm just going to make some room so that we can continue to work. Ah, actually, let's just leave that. Let's just leave that. So for step three, our traditional case, when we we're just doing our one sample, we do something like this. We would do z equals x bar minus mu all over the standard deviation of x root n. Right? That was our standard case for our one sample hypothesis test. In this case, though, we're not dealing with just, hey, is x bar equal to mu? I want to know something about delta mu, the change in my population means. That is, if I subtract one from another, is it equal to zero or different than zero? So that is, for this z statistic, what I'm really looking at is instead of mu, I'm looking at something to do with the change in mu. And that is, if I'm interested in this change in mu, well, the best kind of insight I have as to what that population mean is, is the sample mean. And the best insight I have for the change in population means is going to be this change in sample means. So again, I can work that out to be delta x bar minus delta mu. So I would have my numerator as such. But what about my denominator? Is it just still sigma x all over root n? Uh, not necessarily. Not necessarily. Unfortunately, in this case here, when we go and we subtract two distributions from each other, due to the randomness of where these values fall, because order really isn't important, as we subtract one variance from the other variance, our variance actually gets bigger. So that is, in this case here, we're presuming these two samples are independent of one another. And what I mean by independent is that the survivability of tire one has no influence on the survivability of brand two, right? Independent, they have no influence on one another. If we have two independent samples, my variances are additive. Right? And you're like, variances? Aren't we talking about standard errors? Yeah, yeah, we are. But keep in mind, these standard errors here, let's, let's just make some room and let's talk about that. Right? My standard errors, standard deviation of x all over root n, that is my standard error or my standard deviation of the sample mean. My variance of the sample mean is the variance of x all over n, right? Hey, standard error was just the square root of my variance. So same kind of idea. What we see in this case here, because we are subtracting two distributions from each other, right? If you want to visualize this, we are having some distribution of x bar normally distributed, centered around mu1. We have another, whoop, let's use the right tool there. We have another distribution of x bar. Ah, uh, that guy there is x bar 2. Centered around mu2. As we subtract these guys from each other, well, our variances end up becoming additive such that this whole bottom term here becomes kind of like, right, dramatic pause as we build. What does it become? What does it become? Okay, it works out to become the square root of the variance of 1 all over the sample size of 1 plus the variance of 2 all over the sample size of 2 right? Our variances become additive. And we have a lot of questions. Okay, why is that the case? Why are these variances additive as we go through this? Okay, well, 
let's go through and let's kind of take a look at an example here. Let's say we're going, hey, okay, x bar 1 minus x bar 2. All right, we're just randomly picking values of x bar from each one as we sample and we're subtracting them off. That is, hey, this guy here, maybe I'm getting a value of 5. This guy here, maybe I'm getting a value of negative 5. Okay, let's presume that each of these distributions to start off has a mean of 0 just for simplicity. That is, if we look at my deviation from mean, that deviation from mean was plus 5. This deviation from mean was minus 5, right? This was my sampling error in each case. So, okay, it just so happened one was over, one was under. If I go and I go, okay, x bar 1 minus x bar 2, what, what do I end up getting? Right? x bar 1 minus x bar 2. Well, that was 5 minus negative 5 equals 5 minus negative 5. That equals 10. If I go through that for this whole thing, well, mu 1 minus mu 2, right? What's my new distribution? Well, if I take a look at my new distribution, if each of my x bars were normally distributed, which I have in this case, then my new distribution, we'll call this new distribution delta x bar. Delta x bar will also be normally distributed, centered around delta mu. Well, hey, mu of 0, mu of 0, this guy here would still be 0. But, hey, what's happened? This value was a deviation of 5. This value was a deviation of negative 5. What do I have for my delta x bar? Well, I have my delta x bar here. That's the value I just pulled out of 10, meaning that my deviation is a lot farther. My error is a lot farther, right? So as we go through this for every possible sample as we work through, our variance of this delta x bar distribution, the change, the difference in x bar, this distribution has a much wider variance. It covers a lot more of our number line, less accurate in this case. So anytime we have two independent samples, we're going to run into this where our variance, as soon as we start playing around with this distribution, plus or minus that distribution, will get a widening of the variances, a widening of how much is being covered. And in that case here, strictly additive. Add variance of 1 to variance of 2. Take the square root of it to get our new standard errors. So the idea behind our new, our new sampling, our new sample statistic and our new standard errors for that new sample statistic. Okay, so all that to be said, really the crux of it for an applied course like this is that what you need to know is this is our sample statistic. This is our test statistic that we're gonna be utilizing for step three, right? And okay, in this case here, this test statistic, why are we using this? Well, we're using this because we are asking, and if you wanna think about this, we are asking about mu, right? That's our population parameter. I can do a better mu than that. We are asking about mu, that's our population parameter. It's two sample because I'm asking something about mu1 versus mu2. So, okay, I know I'm this two sample versus that one sample we looked at in the previous videos. Further, I know that it's going to be a z because I know sigma, right? Because I know what that true population standard deviation is. Well, I know that it's going to become a z. Right, farther what I need in order to make that happen is I need n to be large enough such that x bar 1 and x bar 2 are both normally distributed. Uh, we made the assumption in this case such that that was the case as well. So, okay, two independent samples talking about population means we know the population standard deviation. This is the test statistic we use. So, there we have it. Step three. And right, once we introduce all of them, I'll go through a nice little flow chart as to how we can pick out which test statistic in which question. Step four. 
Step four is actually no real different than what we've looked at before, right? Really our big difference is, as I promised, with step one, how we state our null and alternative, and step three, our test statistic there. Step four, step four is nearly identical. So for step four, what we're gonna have is, well, we said in step three, we have a Z distribution. So uh, here we're looking at delta X bar which we will ultimately bring down to a Z. We know that this is going to be normally distributed if each of our X bars themselves are normally distributed. And as we just saw, delta X bar is going to be centered around delta mu with a standard errors equal to variance of one all over N. One plus the variance of two all over n two. And let's keep that in mind, right? We're so used to dealing with standard deviations here. This here is our variance. Oh, let's try that again. Our variance, right? And in this case here, this is just n. This isn't root n, this is just n. So we're dealing with variance over n plus variance over n. Once we get that answer, we then take the square root of that answer. So not till that final step, not till we do all of our summation, do we actually calculate this. What we need to do in step four here, we need to figure out our rejection rule, right? That's what step four was, formulate our rejection rule. And in order to formulate this rejection rule, really all we had to do, we didn't even need to know anything about step three, we had to go back to step two, we had to go back to step one. So we had to go back to step two to figure out what my rejection area was. That is how much area am I putting into that rejection region? And then I had to go back to step one to figure out, okay, what tail am I putting this rejection region into? Keep in mind, it could be a left tail, it could be a right tail, or it could be both tails. In this case, in this scenario, I'm just saying, hey, is mu one any different than mu two? That is, alternatively, is my change in mu different than zero? I don't think this change in mu is positive. I don't think this change in mu is negative. That is, I could put this rejection region in both tails. So putting it in both tails will yield a rejection area there, a rejection area there, such that the total rejection area is 5%. So half in here, 0.025, half in here, 0.025, yielding, well, what I'm gonna to have to calculate as my Z in each case. So, okay, 2.5 there, 2.5 there, that's gonna be 0 0.475, 0 0.475. So if we go to our Z table, and we take a look into the middle of the table, and we try to find, hey, probability, between some value of z and the mean as close as we can to 0 0.475, what we end up getting is 1.96. And that's gonna be either negative 1.96 on that side or positive 1.96 on this side. So in this scenario, we would phrase our, right, our explicit statement of our rejection rule if we calculate some z, right, and such that this z, this value, this magnitude of z is greater than 1.96, we will reject the null, right? And again, what we're doing here is we're saying, hey, the absolute value, the magnitude of this value of z that we calculate is greater than 1.96. That is, if I were to calculate a negative 2, well, the absolute value of negative two is two. That'd be bigger than 1.96, even though negative two is less than negative 1.96. So just again, keep in mind what we're thinking about when we say, hey, absolute value of Z is greater than 1.96. We could again phrase this with respect to the p-values. We could say, if my p-value is less than my significance level, so 0.05, I will again reject my null. Keep in mind again, when we're calculating a p-value for a two-tailed test, 
Two-tailed test, p-value times two. So that's how we need to work through that. Okay, one through four, right? All this has been so far is set up. Just taking information or not information, just kind of thinking through what the question is asking and setting up our question as to how we're going to finally answer it. Step five is finally where we're doing math. Up until this point, it was just set up. So let's take a look at step five. Let's work this out. We're going to need all of this information here now. So step five. For step five, what we do is we go back to step three and we calculate our test statistic and we compare this test statistic to this critical value. So, okay, step five, what do I have? I have Z equals delta X bar. Okay, delta X bar, how did I define my delta again? Right, this is where this is important. I define my delta as mu one minus mu two, right? I purposely kind of kept all of this in white to say, yes, I'm using this guy. That's what I mean by delta mu, not this green one, right? I'm just showing you that it could be either way. Whichever one you choose, make it consistent throughout the whole question. I'm choosing one minus two. That is, I'm choosing 475 minus 481. So let's work that out. What's my delta X bar? 475 minus 481 gives me negative 6,000. Okay, negative 6,000 minus delta mu. Well, what do I presume my delta mu is? I go to my null to figure that out. And I say, well, underneath my null, I believe my delta mu is zero. So negative 6,000 minus zero. Okay, now over our standard errors. Well, for our standard errors, we're taking the square root of variance of one plus variance of two, and then each one was divided by their respective sample size. So, okay. Oh, keep in mind, we have our standard deviations reported, not our variances, right? Good thing to check in. What are we given, right? In this case here, we're given standard deviation. So to get my variance, I would have to go 10,000 squared all over sample size 1, 15. Plus 13,000 squared all over 20. All right, I would want to work out all of that and then take the square root of it to get my variance. So a few steps to work through here. Let's go work this out and figure out what our numerator is. Uh, numerator, that's not too bad, that's 6,000. Denominator, okay, that's gonna take a little bit more work. Let's go through it, 10,000 squared. And 10,000 squared divided by 15. Okay, we're then gonna take that and we're gonna add that to 13,000, oh, I forgot the squared, 13,000 squared. And then we're going to divide that by 20. And let's work that guy there out. So that gives me altogether 15, 15,116,666.67. Uh, 15, but we need to take the square root of that. So I'll take the square root of it. And we get something like 3,888. And we'll carry on a few decimal places here. What do we have? 0, 01, we'll say 0, 016. Okay. So we have our negative 6,000 divided by our calculated standard errors. That's going to give us a Z value of negative 1.54. Okay, so we've calculated our test statistic. We've calculated our test Z statistic as negative 1.54. Keep in mind, we're not done the question, right? To actually finish this question, we have to state what exactly we're doing with this, what the outcome of our experiment has been. And that is, okay, we just calculated negative 1.54. Let's use yellow as to where that falls. There's negative 1.96, positive 1.96. So, okay, that one that I've calculated, That'd be maybe something like here. 
negative 1.54. We can see very clearly that is not in my rejection region. If that is not in my rejection region, well then I will not reject the null. So I would say, therefore, I would fail to reject, right? And if I fail to reject, well, then you can essentially cross off that alternative statement. And that is you don't have enough evidence to support that they're different. That is, yeah, okay, we have two different sample means. The two different sample means differed by 6,000. But given our variability, that very well could just be sampling error, right? That could very well just be sampling error. Again, just to refresh ourselves, to finish off, what we could also do is we could compare this. We could find out, hey, how likely was it that we witnessed this Z value, that Z value, or more extreme, given the assumption that our null is true. And if we were to work that out, right, that is just going to be, hey, probability that we witnessed 1.54 or less, or negative 1.54 or less. Well, if we work that out, we get our p-value, and we get a p-value in that case there. Let's go, oh, let's use the right tool. We would get a p-value equal to, well, this area is going to be 0 0.0618. So, okay, let's back up. Where exactly did we get that from again? What's going on? Well, okay, point five, as we go to our table, as we go look up negative or just look up 1.54, in our table, we get this area between 1.54 and the mean, and we get that to be 0 0.4382. Okay, that's not the area we're looking for, though. We're looking for 1.54 or more extreme. So, hey, this whole half is 50%. 50% minus 0.4382 leaves me with 0 0.0618 left over. Meaning, hey, the probability of witnessing this value or more extreme is 0 0.0618. In order to compare this p-value to my significance level, however, because it's a two-tailed test, I need to times this p-value by 2. So times by two, and I would get a p-value of 0 0.1236. That is, we would say a 12.36% chance of witnessing a value of that magnitude or more extreme. So not hugely likely, but not ridiculously unlikely either. So Right, we would have still rejected this even if we had, or sorry, we still would have failed to reject this even if we had set our significance level at 10%. 12% still wouldn't have been into that reject area. So we end up having kind of our strength of evidence based off of our p-value. Well, let's take a look at next sample proportions. So what if we have two different proportions and we want to test the difference? Hey, do I have evidence that this proportion is different than that proportion? Well, in this case, let's just start off by introducing our test statistic. Proportions, right, if we have this case that for each one, NP and 1 minus P are both greater than or equal to 5, well then, and all of our binomial conditions are met, well then our sample proportion will be normally distributed. We've seen this as we've gone through in the previous cases. Right. If all of that is met, then P bar will be normally distributed, centered around the true population proportion. Also, you'll see that at times as pi. And with a standard deviation of P 1 minus P all over N. And again, you'll see those P's appear as pi at times, depending on the textbook or the author in the case. Same scenario, just different notation. Well, in this case here, so again, just to be clear, that was our one sample case. In the case of our two sample, well, what we're going to be asking about in this case is something about delta P, right? Some, or alternatively, again, depending on notation, delta pi. Really, we're saying, hey, do we have evidence that there is a difference in population proportions 
between this sample and that sample. And the way we'd go about testing that is just the same as we saw with our population mean and sample mean. That is, we would take a difference in our p bars, compare this difference, and say, is that significant enough of a difference to warrant kind of evidence against this being the same? So in this case here, our statistic that we would utilize is again a z, again a z if each value of p bar is normally distributed, if we can make those assumptions there. Then we will have a case such that, again, delta p bar, so change in our sample means, minus the change in the population proportion, all over, uh, this is where it gets a little bit ugly here, we're going to have, let's hopefully I make myself enough room for this, all over pc, 1 minus PC, take all of that all over N, and then we're going to go plus PC, 1 minus PC, all over N. And sorry, this would be our N from our first sample and N from our second sample, so N1, N2. So as we're going through this, you're probably looking at this and going, okay, what the heck is PC? So, okay, we need to introduce this term as well. PC, this is x1 plus x2 all over n1 plus n2. And that is, as we would say, our cumulative proportion, right? It's the cumulative proportion between all together, all of our sample successes from one, total sample size from one. All of our sample successes from two, all over sample size of two. So we'd work through it in that kind of fashion. Let's take a look at a quick kind of example to really demonstrate this, and then we'll carry on to our next one. So let's suppose that we are interested in, really, is there any difference in the proportion of conservative MPs versus liberal MPs who support having high environmental standards? So. Right, we can we can write this down so we can actually see it. Is there a difference? And actually, no, I, I want to change this because I want to take a look at a bit of a different case from our last one. So let's write this this way. Is there evidence? that liberals are more in favor of environmental policies than conservatives. And then we end up sampling them and we get the following kind of table based off of that. So let's take a look at our table. So we would have, let's take a look at first, we can use kind of our Canadian colors for liberal versus conservative. There's our liberals, blue for conservatives. And we'll take a look at our number in favor of environmental policies and versus our sample size in each case. So, okay. For our liberals, we're going to say that 200 of those sampled were in favor, and altogether we sampled 1,000 liberals, right? So maybe we're not talking about MPs, that'd be way too many MPs. We're just talking about liberal, people who voted liberal or who are card-carrying liberals. It is actually part of the Liberal Party. Alternatively, we want to take a look at conservatives and take a look at the same kind of idea. And let's say for conservatives, we have the following. We have 140 in favor versus uh, we were only able to survey 800 of them. So a little bit different sample size in each case. Okay, so our question, right? In this case here, this is our question. 
we now need to adopt our five steps of hypothesis testing in order to work this out. First step, state our null, state our alternative. So, okay, one null versus alternative. So there's our null, there's our alternative. Well, okay, looking at the question, everything we have is just X and N. We don't have any standard deviations. We don't have any means, anything like that. I just introduced P bar. What do we have going on here? We have a question about population proportions. What exactly are we asking in respect to this? Well, we're asking, is there evidence that liberals are more in favor of environmental policies than conservatives? So, okay, reading that, I would say, is price, uh, price, is the proportion of liberals in favor greater than the proportion of conservatives in favor. And unfortunate notation here, I do want to use proportion conservative because I also have this PC over here as my cumulative proportion. And I don't want to confuse the two by just making this guy PC. So again, if this is my alternative saying, hey, is there evidence that liberals are more in support than conservatives? My null becomes the opposite right, with an equality. My null always includes an equality. Okay, from here, what we have to do is we have to rearrange this, right? Just like we did for our means, we have to rearrange this to make it to be about zero. So again, if we go and do that, we can go, okay, is zero, greater than, uh, sorry, let's go the other way. Let's go price liberal minus price conservatives greater than zero versus our null price liberal minus price conservatives price. I keep saying price. Proportion liberals minus proportion conservatives is actually less than or equal to zero. So again, we always need to restate our null and our alternative to be about a actual number. Typically, in this course, we're always going to presume that to be zero. And that's typically our case. Two, okay. Two, we want to test this. Let's suppose we're not really too keen on it. We want to test this at a 10% significance level. That is, uh, if we engage in a type 1 error, that is, if we accidentally reject the null when the null was actually true, there's not a lot at stake here. It's not like we're going to lose a bunch. So, not, not too concerned. Step 3, what's happening in step 3 here? Well, in step 3, all we're doing is we're pulling forward our test statistic. So, in this case here, we're dealing with two proportions. We're testing about a difference between the two. So we're doing our two sample hypothesis test around a population proportion. That gives us this guy here. So well, let's write that down. We have Z equals delta P bar minus delta P all over big garbly goop on the bottom. PC one minus PC. And what I can do is I can actually cheat. Let's write this in a little bit of a cleaner way. Let's write it like this. PC1 minus PC times 1 over N1 plus 1 over N2. Right? And this is mathematically exactly the same. Just I get to avoid writing PC1 over 1 minus PC twice, right? Which is just a bunch to write. Just to remind ourselves, what I like to do as well in step three here is I like to write down what exactly is PC, right? Just to remind myself, hey, I need to calculate this. So PC, that was X1 plus X2 all over N1 plus N2. So, okay, I have my step three all taken care of. Step four. Step four here. Okay, step four is I'm going to explicitly state my decision rule. So let's take a look. I'm going to have delta P bar normally distributed, right? It's going to be normally distributed if 
each of the p bars is normally distributed. And right, that's if n p and one minus p are greater than or equal to five. So in this case here, if I were to work that out, uh, we don't know what p is for sure, but we can use kind of our p bar in lieu of that. So hey, for liberals, right, we can go like this. P bar 200 over 1,000, that's 20%. Conservatives, uh, conservatives will have a P bar of 140 over 800. That's going to be 0 0.175 or 17.5%. So, okay, in each case, N times P. So, let's go 800 times 0.175. Ah, that gives me 140. 1 minus p, that's going to be give me the difference, right? Same case here for the liberals. 1,000 times 0.2, that's going to give me 200. 1,000 times 1 minus p, that's going to give me the difference, 800. So, yeah, I'm, I'm bigger than 5. I'm good in each of my cases. Each of my p bars will be normally distributed. If each of my p bars is normally distributed, then delta p bar is as well. What am I presuming? Well, I'm presuming that, go to my null, that delta p bar is less than or equal to zero. So the big thing there, equal to zero. So there we go. I then need to go and figure out, am I dealing with a left or a right tail test? And how much area am I putting in my rejection zone? So, okay, first of all, for area in my rejection zone, I'm dealing with a 10% significance level. So, okay, 10%. And in this case here, I'm looking for a delta P bigger than zero. So here's zero, I'm looking bigger than, so I'm dealing over here, and I have my rejection zone, 10%. Okay, what if you had written this the other way? What if you had gone and you had said, okay, zero is greater than, P conservative minus P liberal. Is that a problem? Have you got this wrong now because of that? No, 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 you haven't. The only difference is as you go through conducting this test, instead of being a right tail, you would have worked it all out being, hey, delta P is less than zero, less than zero. You would have just put your zone over there on the left. That's the only difference. This, though, is where it's, where it's very important that as you work through, hey, what's delta P, what's delta P bar, you keep consistency. Because if I do delta P as L minus C, but then I do delta P bar as C minus L, I'm going to end up in opposite tails, and I'm going to get a result I don't want. So make sure you keep your consistency. Again, in this case, the green was just an example. We're going to be using the white and thus the right tail test. Ultimately, we take this, we standardize to a Z to get our critical value, and that is for our critical value. If we have 10% there, we have 40% there. To find out what that is, okay, 40%. Go to our table, try to find the one as close as we can to 40% in that table. As we do so, we get a critical value of 1.28. So, okay, explicitly stating this, what do we have? We would say, if my Z value that I calculate is greater than 1.28, I will reject the null, right? And again, let's just quickly take a look. What if you had done it this way, right? I'll just quickly introduce this again and then we'll erase it. You would have been looking here. You would have been looking at 10%. That is, you would have found negative 1.28. So you would have said, hey, if my Z value was less than negative 1.28, reject the null. So again, the distinction there, just depending on which scenario you used. Again, we use the white, so we're going to continue on in that way there. Okay, 
Again, we can also phrase this in with, with respect to our p-values. We could say, hey, if my p-value is less than my significance level, so less than 10%, we will reject our null. So again, it can always be phrased with respect to the p-value. And that, that doesn't change, right? That doesn't change regarding direction. That would always be the same. Okay, step five. Step five, let's actually decide what's going on. So for step five, right, again, we go back to step three. We use step three to populate step five. So what do we have? We have this whole bit going on here. And we notice that, hey, we need this PC guy in order to calculate it. Where PC pre, uh, proportion cumulative is X1 plus X2. X liberal plus X conservative all over n1 plus n2. Well, n liberal plus n conservative. So what do we get for that? We'll start off by doing our PC. That will be 200 plus 140 all over 1,000 plus 800. Okay, working through that then, we get 340 all over 1800, 340 over 1800, that yields for us 0 0.18, uh, 8888888 repeating. So we'll just carry around a few and then round it to that nine. So we have that going on there. We then want to work out our actual Z value. So hey, Z is delta P bar. So delta P bar, how did we define delta P bar? Well, we defined delta P bar as, let's go take a look, liberal minus conservative. So we would go P bar liberal minus P bar conservative. That was 200 over 1,000, 20% 1 minus 140 over 800. 0.175%. So that is my value of delta P bar is 0.2 minus 0.175. That is 0 0.025 minus delta P. What do I presume my delta P is? Well, what am I know? Delta P is less than or equal to zero. So honing in on that equal to zero. We get zero all over our square root of PC. What do we say PC was? One eight eight nine times one minus one eight eight nine. So one minus point one eight eight nine yields us. 0 0.8111 and then times 1 over n1 so n1 was a thousand plus 1 over n2 of 800 and right carry that guy on there as well so okay let's work this out numerator that's easy that's just 2.5 percent 0 0.025 Numerator, a little bit more work. Let's work that out. We have 1 over 1,000 plus 1 over 800. Okay, then we're going to times that by 0 0.8111. And then we're going to times that by 0 0.1889. Okay, that gives us all together the square root of 0 0.000. .000 Three, four, four, seven. Okay, take the square root of that guy there, and we get 0 0.025 all over 0 0.01857, yielding for us a Z statistic of 1.0. Three, uh, three, four, six. So Zs usually we'll do that to two decimal places. So we'll go one point three five. 
Okay, so we've calculated our Z statistic, right? We've calculated our test statistic. We want to calculate, we want to compare this rather to our critical value. And what did we say? We said, hey, if Z is greater than 1.28, reject the null. Well, okay, we got a Z of 1.35. That is greater. If we wanted to think about where that is greater, let's do that in yellow. There's 1.28. Well, we just worked out 1.35. That is a rejection, right? That's in that rejection region. So we would say, therefore, we will be to reject the null. So reject the null. If we go up to kind of take a look at what that means, you can kind of cross off our null, meaning to suggest that we have evidence that the proportion of liberals that support environmental policies is in fact greater than the proportion of conservatives at the 10% level. And that's important, that last bit, at the 10% level. Because let's figure out what our p-value is and let's figure out what that strength of evidence is. That is, what is probability of witnessing 1.35 or greater that area? Well, if we want to figure that out, we can put in, we can look up 1.35. As we go and look up 1.35, we get, let's take a look here. Oh, we get on our table, I don't get the right tool going on here. Between 1.35 and the mean, we get 0 0.4115. That's not the area we're looking for. We're looking for this area, 1.35 and greater. That is this yellow shaded area. So 0.5 minus that, and that gives us 0 0.0885, meaning we would have a p-value of 0 0.0885 or 8.85% 8 chance. Right. This is, again, why it's so important we choose our significance level before we conduct our test. Because, hey, given this significance level, we can see that we would reject at the 10% level, but we would not reject at the 5% level, right? We have enough evidence at the 10%, but this would not be sufficient evidence if we were to test this at the 5% level. So, again, why it's important to set our level of significance before we conduct our test. Because otherwise, I could take a look at this p-value and I can go, oh, Okay, well, I'm going to set my significance level at 5%, and at 5%, look, there's no difference between the number of liberals and the number of conservatives who support these policies. Alternatively, if I wanted to prove that there was a difference, I could take a look at this p-value, and I could say, okay, I'm going to set my significance level at 10% and show that there is a difference between the two, right? So, unfortunately, with lots of these, in reality, Often what ends up happening when you read the media, when you read what's going on in the news and this kind of stuff is reported, often they do all the work and then they determine their significance level. And by doing so, they end up getting to tell the story they want to tell. Look, liberal support more than conservatives because I chose a 10% level. Alternatively, look, conservatives and liberals both support environmental policies the same because I chose a 5% level. So again, that choice of significance level would be important in those scenarios and something to watch out for, to be critical of as you read the news and the like. So again, that was our difference in proportions based off of our two sample hypothesis test. Let's take a look at another example. Let's take a look at example. Again, we'll go back to taking a look at our mean our population mean, look for a difference in population means. But in this case, we'll be saying, okay, difference in population means when we have two independent samples. So, okay, let's write this down. Again, we'll be taking a look at our difference in population means with two independent 
samples. All right, and so far all of our two sample hypothesis tests have been with independent samples. And that means that the outcome on test one, the outcome on sample one has no influence on sample two. Right, in this case here, the number of conservatives that support had no influence on the number of liberals that support. The survivability of tire brand one had no influence on the survivability of tire brand two. They were entirely independent. Same holds in this case here. It won't be until our last example that we'll take a look at dependent samples. And those things get a little bit different. So let's take a look at our last case here. Again, let's just introduce our well, let's just introduce our test statistic to get started off. It's starting to get a little bit uglier, but it's just a bunch of math, right? We can do math. It's why we have calculators. Really, the big part is the critical thinking of setting up the question and working through it. So again, to set up, we'll take a look at step three. In this case, difference in population means with two independent samples. Oh, I missed the important part. Sigma is unknown. That is, we don't know what that true population standard deviation is, right? We have to estimate it using the sample standard deviation. So this is the opposite case as to what we started with, right? We started off with sigma known. This case, we're taking a look at sigma unknown. So, okay, in this case here, what do we have? We're going to have a T. And in this case here, our T is going to be... Uh, Bit of a different standard, uh, or sorry, degrees of freedom. Tn1 plus n2 minus 2. And then it's going to be, well, for a numerator, much the same as what we were expecting, right? We're looking at something about difference in population means. So same as before, we'll test that as delta x bar minus delta mu. Our standard errors, though. Our standard errors, this is where things start to get ugly again. And our standard errors, these can be worked out as the square root of what I will call our pooled variance times 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2. So, okay, just like we had with our proportions, we have this new situation going on there. With our proportions, we had a cumulative proportion. In this case, we have a pooled variance. So how exactly do we figure out this pooled variance? Well, okay, the pooled variance is going to be, let's take a look, pooled variance. It's going to be degrees of freedom for our first one. So n1 minus 1. n1 minus 1 times the variance of 1. Plus n2 minus 2 times the variance of 2. All over our total new degrees of freedom. n1 plus n2 minus 2. So Okay, whole bunch going on there. Degrees of freedom of our first sample times the variance of our first sample, sample variance of our first sample, plus the degrees of freedom. Oh, look at that, I messed up. N2 minus 1, right? Degrees of freedom from our second sample. I think an N2 and then a 2 is stuck in my head, so minus 2. No, no, no. Degrees of freedom from our second sample, N2 minus 1 times the sample variance from our second sample. All of that divided by our new degrees of freedom, n1 plus n2 minus 2. So a whole bunch going on in our new step 3. Okay, as we go through this, of course, in order to be t distributed, we have to be able to appeal to the central limit theorem as we did before. That is, you need n greater than 3 if the population is assumed normal, greater than 10, if the population is symmetric, or greater than 30, if our population is unknown. Additionally, in order to use this, we have a few conditions. So, okay, let's, let's write down these conditions. One, 
appeal to central limit theorem. And that's been true for all of our cases so far, right? All of our cases, we had to ensure that X bars or P bars would have been normally distributed on their own. So that they would appeal to the central limit theorem. Second one, our second case, our second condition is that our samples need to be independent. And again, so far, that has been true for all three of these cases we've looked at so far. Our difference in population mean of two independent samples when sigma is known, our difference in population proportion of two independent samples, and now in this case as well, our difference in population means with two independent samples when sigma is unknown. So our first two conditions, these have actually been implicitly being applied to all of our cases thus far. Our third one, our third one's a new one. And this is strictly an assumption that we have to make. And this assumption we have to make is that sigma one equals sigma two. That is, we don't know what the true population standard deviations are, but we have to assume they're equal. And truthfully, there is a test that we could do. We could do a two sample hypothesis test around sigma sigma and thus our sample standard deviation s s has its own sampling distribution around sigma we could do a two sample hypothesis test hey work out delta sigma delta s and go through all that outside of the scope of this course right that distribution is not a distribution that we've known how to work with here so we just have to make this assumption we just have to say, yeah, okay, we're gonna presume they come from populations with the same standard deviation, or we're gonna say, ah, we don't presume that. In fact, okay, in this course, we'll always presume this is true. And I'm not gonna go about introducing the tools for when this is different. We could take a look at it. Trust me, it's ugly. You're not gonna to want to. So just for simplicity's sake, and because ah, we don't need to, we're just gonna make this assumption and presume this is the case. So that is our test statistic. Okay, let's take a look at a quick kind of example on this as to how we would work through this. So let's presume, let's just jump over here. Let's presume we wanna work out if there's a difference in the weekly income. So again, is there a difference in weekly income between nurses and teachers. And let's suppose that we end up collecting the following sample of each one. And additionally, we presume, uh, we presume that incomes are normally distributed. Right, and make, by making this assumption, this just really makes it easier for us so that we can have smaller sample sizes. Smaller sample sizes means that we can get away with a sample size as small as three. So let's suppose that we have teachers and we have nurses, and then taking a look, let's create a bit of a table here. We're gonna have week one, week two, week three, and week four. And we're pulling out a sample income in each side. So teachers, we have one earning a weekly income of 845. We have another teacher earning 827. Another one earning 875. And then a final one earning 820. For nurses, uh, we're pulling out 821. We're pulling out 771 and we're pulling out 825. We don't have a fourth sample from our nurses. We only have three, but hey, we're presuming that incomes are normally distributed, so we don't need any more. Three is that minimum number in order to appeal to our central limit theorem. So there's our initial setup, our question as it would appear. 
we want to work through, we want to conduct our five steps of hypothesis testing and figure out, hey, is there a difference in weekly income between nurses and teachers? And okay, I'm being lazy writing this down. I'm trying to make this a bit faster. Really, is there a difference in average weekly income? That's really how that should be written. So let's let's actually write that as it appears in the question I'm copying this from. Is there a difference in average weekly income between nurses and teachers? Okay, so okay, in this case here, what are we using? What is our population parameter as we go to stating our null and our alternative? Our two possible scenarios, mu or proportion. Well, in this case here, what is the difference in average weekly income? That's our good hint. The other good hint is that I'm dealing in this case here in dollars, right? Average weekly income. So I'm getting a weekly income, weekly income, weekly income. And hey, this is a continuous variable. I can take the average of this. I can compare this average to that average. Hey, I have this average carrying around a lot. I'm asking something to do with mu. And something to do with mu teachers versus mu nurses. And what exactly is that that I'm asking? Well, I'm just saying, is there a difference? So, hey, are these two not equal versus my null? Then, in fact, they are one and the same. There's no difference between what teachers and nurses make on average. Well, again, I have to rephrase this. I have to rephrase this. And the way we're going to rephrase this is that mu teachers minus mu nurses equals zero. Mu nurses equals zero. And our alternative is that teachers minus nurses does not equal zero. Of course, you could have phrased that the other way. You could have done new nurses minus new teachers. That's perfectly fine. Consistency is just the key in this. Consistency is the key. Let's conduct this test at, uh, we've already done a few. Let's do at the 1% level in this case here. So we'll set a significance level of 1%. Step three, step three, let's identify our test statistic. Well, in identifying our test statistic, we need to say, okay, first of all, am I dealing with mu? Am I dealing with population proportion? That is population mean or population proportion? Well, okay, going back to step one, I know I'm dealing with the population mean. So, okay, I know this has to either be a Z or a T. The determining factor as to whether it's a Z or a T comes down to whether or not I know what the population standard deviation is. In this case, I know nothing about the population other than that they are normally distributed. So that means I'm going to have to calculate a sample standard deviation. Oh, uh, that's going to suck, but we can do it, right? It's not going to be too bad. So sample standard deviation, I'm going to be using a T. So in that case there, I'm going to be using this guy down there. So that is, I'm going to be having a T, and what's my degrees of freedom? N1. N1 plus N2 minus 2, so 4 plus 3 is 7, 7 minus 2 is 5. I'll be dealing with a T5 distribution, which is equal to uh, delta X bar minus delta, oh, delta mu all over. my pooled variance, 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2. Where again, I want to remind myself, how do I calculate that pooled variance? I like to throw this in this step just so that I have all the tools that I need. Pooled variance is degrees of freedom from the first one. So n1 minus 1 times the variance of the first. Plus our degrees of freedom from the second one. So n2 minus 1 times the variance of our second one all over my new degrees of freedom. So that's gonna be N1 plus N2 minus two. So what I'm gonna use once I get to step five in order to calculate my test statistic. 
step four then. Okay, step four is determining our decision rule. So step four, determining our decision rule. We have delta x bar, presuming it's centered around zero according to our null. And we need to standardize this. And in this case here, we are standardizing it to a T5, right? Based off of that guy there. So standardizing to a T5, we need to figure out what area do we put in our rejection and where this rejection area is going to be. So not equal to, I don't have a statement of direction. That is either tail. So I'm going to have a two tailed test. That is, I'm putting half of this area in each one. That is, 1% 1 is my total rejection area. So 0 0.005 in each tail. So 0, 0.005 is what I have in that case there. To find my critical value, I need to go to my table, or alternatively, you can use Excel to calculate this. What you would need to do is for five degrees of freedom, for five degrees of freedom, you want to look up an alpha, right? That's how it is on our t-table. You'd want to look up an alpha of 0 0.005 to get that corresponding t-statistic. And that corresponding t-statistic would be uh, negative 4.032 and positive 4.032. So again, to explicitly state this, we could say if the absolute value of our T5 is greater in magnitude than 4.032, we will reject the null. Otherwise, of course, we will fail to reject. Now again, keep in mind, with the tables, we cannot easily work out p-values. You would need to use a stats program like Excel to calculate your p-values. You can do so though, right? And thus we could state, if our p-value was less than our significance level, we would again reject the null. And again, keep in mind, two-tailed test, whatever p-value we calculate, times two. So how you'd have to work through that. Step five, finally our calculation. Step five here, this is gonna be a lot of work because we need to find out delta x bar. In order to find out delta x bar, we need to find out what x bar teachers is. We need to find out what x bar nurses is. We need to find out what our pooled variance is. In order to find our pooled variance, we need to know the variance of teachers. We need to know the variance of nurses. So a lot of steps to work through this, a lot of math to go through. Now, okay, if you're good, if you're comfortable using Excel or another stats program, maybe like R, great, this is fast, this is easy, you can power through it. To refresh ourselves as to what exactly that program is doing behind the scenes, I'm going to go through it here by hand just to refresh ourselves of those basic skills, that basic arithmetic as to what exactly we're doing. Because it's very easy for the computer to say, boom, here's your answer. Sometimes you can forget what that answer actually means, and then you can't be critical as to whether or not you got the computer to give you the right thing. Right? The computer will always give you what you told it to do, but did you ask for the right thing? And that's sometimes the error that we make. So let's work through that. Let's start off with x teachers. So, okay, our x values for teachers are 845, 827, 875, and finally 820. I want to figure out my value of x bar. So, to remind ourselves, x bar is the summation of x all over n. So I want to add all these guys up and divide by 4. So 845 plus 827 plus 875 plus 820 divided by 4 
Well, let's go times four first. So altogether, that summation was 3,367. That was my summation. Giving me, let's use blue for this, X bar teacher of 841. 75. So, okay, we have our average weekly income for a teacher. What we then want to work out is our variance of teachers, right? Sample variance. So, variance again. Variance of x is the summation of x minus x bar squared all over n minus 1. So, again, sample variance n minus 1. So what I want to work out in this case here is x minus x bar squared. So that would be 845 minus 841.75. And then that answer there, squared. So I get 10, 5, 6, 2, 5. 827 minus 841.75 squared gives me 217. Uh, 5625, 875 minus 841.75 squared gives me 1,105, uh, 5625, and then finally 820 minus 841.75 squared gives me 473 and 06.25. Okay, so I've worked out each of my dev squared deviations from mean. I now want my sum of squared deviations from mean, so I take the summation of this entire column. So 473.0625 plus 1105.5625 plus 217, uh, 5.625, plus 10.5625, giving me 1,806.75. So this guy here, this guy here is my numerator in that case there. I can take this divided by n minus 1, that is this guy divided by 3, to get my variance of teachers, and thus my variance of teachers, 1,806.75 1, divided by 3, gives me a variance of 602.25. Keep in mind, this is all squared, so technically this would be 602.25 dollars square dollars, if that makes any sense, right? So, okay, we have our average income, sample average income. We have our sample variance. We now need to do the same thing for our nurses. So, okay, rinse, wash, repeat. X, nurses. What do we have in this case? We have 821. 777. Sorry, 771. And 825. So again, to start off, we want to find our mean. So mean summation of our x's. So 821 plus 771 plus 825 is 2417. I get an x bar for my nurses, 2417 divided by 3 of 805. Uh, we'll go 67. It's actually 6667, but we'll go 67. Then similarly, I need to find out my square deviations from mean. So x minus x bar squared. We have 821 minus 80567 squared. So that'll be 235, uh, 0089. 771 minus 80567. Square that answer and we get 1202, 0089. 
And then finally, 825 minus 805, 67, square that answer, and we get 373. 6489. Again, we want the summation of all this to get our sum of squared deviations. So, sorry, at the bottom, 373, 6489, plus 1202, plus 235, That's going to yield a sum of squared deviations of 1810. Oh, that's a funny zero. 1810 and 6. Six seven. So again, we can just keep that to two decimal places. Maybe we should probably carry on a few extra, but let's just keep it to two for simplicity's sake. Very similarly, we can find out the variance, the sample variance for nurses. Sum of square deviations divided by n minus one, so eighteen ten sixty seven divided by two, gives me nine oh five. 33. And again, variance, so technically in square dollars. So, wow, right? All of that would just be a question on its own right at the start of the semester. How far we've come. Everything we've done so far is really just to build up to this, to be able to do these kind of questions. So, now we have almost everything we need. We have x bar, we have our sample variance. We have x bar, we have our sample variance. What we need to calculate next is this pooled variance. So let's let's calculate that guy. Our pooled variance is n1 minus 1 times the variance, sample variance of 1. So n1 minus 1, that was 3 times 602.25. Plus, uh, that's 2, right? n minus 1, so 3 minus 1 is 2, times my sample variance, 905.33, all over n1 plus n2 minus 2, so 4 plus 3 is 7, minus 2 is 5. What do I get? Ah, that works out to be a pooled variance of 700 and 23, I will go 48 squared dollars. So I have my pooled variance. Now I have everything I need. Now it's just going to be plugging information in and solving for my T5, my test statistic. So that took a while. Okay, what color haven't we used yet? Let's go back to white. So our T5. Our T5 is delta x bar. So x bar is going to be x bar t minus x bar n. Well, actually, let's just confirm. What did we say in here? We said t minus n, right? Always good to double check to keep our consistency. So teachers minus nurses. So as we go through this, we want 841.75 minus 805.67, giving us... 3608 as our delta x bar. We then want to subtract from delta mu. Again, in this case, we're presuming. Again, in this case, based off of our null, we are assuming that delta mu equals zero. We are then taking all of this and we are dividing by the square root of. Our pooled variance, 723.48, 1 over n1, which is 4, plus 1 over n2, which is 3. So simplifying that down, I get 3608 in my numerator. My denominator is 1 fourth plus 1 third times 723.48, that yields 
take the square root of that, and that's over 20.54. So in this case here, I get a T5 of 3608 divided by 20.54. That is, I get 1.7. Uh, 7565, so we'll go 1.757. Okay, not done yet, right? What we have to do is we have to figure out what exactly this number means. And to figure out what that number means, we have to go back to step four. We said, okay, if our T5 is greater than 4.032, reject our null. Well, what did we just calculate? 1.757? Well, that's something like this. That clearly is not in my rejection region. Clearly not at all. So we would say, therefore, we fail to reject. That is, we fail to reject the null. So if we went back up, we could cross off this alternative statement. That is to say, we do not have evidence that these two are different. We fail to reject our null, meaning that, yeah, right now it's looking like the average weekly income of teachers and nurses is one and the same, or at least not statistically different from one another, not significantly different. Of course, we could finally work out this p-value. What is the probability of witnessing 1.757 or more extreme? if the null was true. Keep in mind, you cannot calculate this given your, given your tables. You would have to use Excel or the like to do so. We could calculate that. We could say, okay, we have a value of 1.757, and that would give us this or more extreme as 0.0. .0 696. 0.0696 is what we would have in that case there. So to get our p-value, p-value is times by two, right? Two-tailed test times by two. So 0 0.0696 times two, we would have a p-value in this case of 13.92 or 0 0.1392, meaning there was about a, almost a 14% chance of witnessing what we had witnessed or more extreme if in fact our null was true. So fairly likely, right? We would have failed to reject at the 10%, the 5%, and the 1%. We would have failed to reject all the way through. So we have this outcome here. Okay. So we've taken a look now at three different cases of independent two samples. Well, let's, let's talk about this. Independent two samples, right? And independent two samples, again, what we mean by independent is that the outcome in sample one had no influence on the outcome in sample two. The two were strictly independent from each other. What we need to identify in each case is, first of all, what's our population parameter? Well, uh, I should back up. I should back up. First of all, what you need to identify before you even get to that, are you dealing with one sample? That is what we were looking at in the previous chapter. Or are you taking a look at a two sample situation? That's always the first one you should make sure that you're clear as to which one you're dealing with. One versus two samples. Once you're sure as to which one you're dealing with, well, okay, we're going to come over here and we're going to take a look at what is our population parameter. Our two options, you're either dealing with a population mean, mu, and write something about mu1 versus mu2, or something to deal with our population proportion. Proportion 1 versus Proportion 2. Okay. In each case, what you next need to be able to do is you need to be able to say, all right, we need to be able to assume, can we appeal to our central limit theorem? 
That is, can we presume that our sample statistics, the corresponding sample statistics, so in this case here, x bar is normally distributed, or p e bar normally distributed, can we make that assumption? If yes, we can carry on. If no, we're actually done. We stop right here. We can't go any farther. If yes, well, okay, for mu, we have two scenarios. We have sigma 1 and sigma 2 are known. Or we have sigma 1 and sigma 2 are unknown. And I need to put a little caveat here, but presumed equal. Okay. Based off of this, we have if sigma 1, sigma 2 are known, we can then go use z equals delta x bar minus delta mu all over Variance of 1 over n1. Variance of 2 over 2. If sigma 1 and sigma 2 are unknown but presumed equal, well, okay, then we need to know our sample standard deviations, and we can calculate those if they're not given to us. And if that's the case, we're then going to have a t, n1 plus n2 minus 2, which is delta x bar minus delta mu all over our pooled variance, 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2. We're okay, our pooled variance, what's that guy again? Pooled variance is degrees of freedom from the first sample times the variance of the first sample plus degrees of freedom from the second sample times the variance of the second sample, all over, all over our total degrees of freedom. So again, what we're really identifying here, based off of what population parameter we've identified in step one, we need to work through this flow chart, and this is going to be our corresponding test statistic in step Three. Population proportion. If we can appeal to the central limit theorem, we don't have any ifs, ands, or buts. We can just go down and we can say that we're z distributed such that delta p minus delta p bar is equal or not equal to all over my cumulative proportion pc1 minus pc times 1 over n1 plus 1 over n2, right? So very, very similar in the denominator for each of these guys. Pooled variance, kind of this pooled proportion, 1 over n1, 1 over n2, 1 over n1, 1 over n2. Pooled or cumulative proportion, how exactly do we get that guy again? Well, PC, that is number of successes in the first one, number of successes in the second one, all over n1 plus n2. So my scenario in that case there. We can kind of go break that in half, right, as we split this down, depending on which route we go down, again, assuming we have two samples. If we aren't dealing with two samples, if we're just in that one sample world, well, then refer back to that previous video that we looked at and the flow chart in our one sample hypothesis tests. Very much the same idea, right? Are we dealing with mu? Are we dealing with p? Can we appeal to the central limit theorem? If it's mu, do I know sigma or is sigma unknown? If I know sigma, great, use a z. If sigma is unknown, use a t. If I have a proportion and the proportion appeals to the central limit theorem, use a z. Right, same kind of idea behind the flowchart, but different test statistics being utilized. So that's our case here for independent two sample hypothesis tests, our three different new test statistics to utilize.
We're going to finish up this video then taking a look at our dependent samples. And this changes things a little bit, not drastically, but a little bit. And what we need to do is take a look at this idea behind our dependent two samples. And really, as we do so, we'll take a look at why dependent samples are actually preferred. Why we would rather have a dependent sample, if at all possible. So let's go and take a look at those. And really, we're just going to be looking at dependent samples for differences in population mean. So just taking a look at mu, that's our only possible option for this case. Dependent samples. So in the case of dependent samples, this is a scenario where the outcome of one scenario influences the outcome in another. So, okay, why exactly would that be? Well, let's take a look at a scenario. Let's say that you are, maybe you're in finance, maybe you're working at a bank, you're a branch manager, and one of the things that you need to do is in giving mortgages, you have to appraise the properties, right? You have to get the value as to what this property is worth, what the real estate is worth for you to be able to lend against it. Now, you really want accurate assessments of value here because that's how you're determining how much you can give your clients. If the property is appraised too high, you can give your clients too much money and now you're stuck with a whole bunch of risk. So you want accurate appraisals. Appraisal property is, okay, it's a science, but it's also a very, very art. It's very subjective based off a lot of things. You can get different appraisal amounts from different appraisers. So let's presume that you're concerned that one of your appraisers is consistently appraising properties too high. And so you go and you end up getting the following kind of situation. You have appraisal one or appraiser one and you have appraiser two. You then have, you hire both of these appraisers to go out and take a look at three different properties. So we're gonna take a look at house one, take a look at house two, and take a look at house three. Let's make a little bit of a matrix here with this, or a little bit of a table. Okay, so, you send both of them out and appraiser one, they rate house one at $235,000. Appraiser two, well appraiser two rates this as 228. Property two, house two, we get 210 and 205. House three, we get 231 and 219. So, okay, as we look at this, it seems, right, just right off the bat, it seems like, hey, appraiser one consistently is appraising houses higher than appraiser two. And potentially this is a concern, right? Potentially we need to have a word with this appraiser or maybe we don't want to continue hiring them. They're giving way too much value to these houses, potentially. What we want to do is we want to test if this is the case. We want to test if on average, Let's write that down. Test if on average, appraiser one is valuing real estate higher than appraiser two. Okay. So on average, is appraiser one valuing real estate more than appraiser two? Well, okay, in our traditional case, we could just go through and we could work this out. Hey, we don't know what X bar is. We don't know what our standard deviation is. So we have this whole average though. So we do know step one, no alternative. I'm doing something about mu one versus mu two mu1 versus mu2. In this case here, I wanna test if on average appraiser one is valuing real estate higher. So that is value one on average is higher than two. Versus my null that no, in fact, one is lower or the same, right? So I have my null and alternative. Of course, I can rewrite these guys. 
want to rewrite these guys to be around zero again. So, okay, this case here is going to be that mu1 minus mu2 is greater than zero versus my null that mu1 minus mu2 is actually less than or equal to zero. So again, stating it with respect to zero. Step two, step two, state our significance level. Let's say we're interested at the 5% level, just to pick a value here. Step three, well, step three is where we now have our difference. And our difference now is the nature that this is a dependent sample. And you might be saying, Kate, but Keith, why is this a dependent sample? What is so special about this that makes it dependent? Well, in this case, if we think about real estate, this house has some characteristics attached to it, right? How close is it to a school? How close is it to water? How well kept is it? How is the landscaping? The characteristics of this house are going to impact this appraiser. They're also going to impact this appraiser. That is, these two observations are paired together, right? These are paired observations. It wouldn't make sense to compare this guy and that guy, right? These are two different houses. So, right, if we want to compare and contrast that, we can go back two pages here. We had kind of a similar table here. We had teachers, we had nurses, right? We could go here. This was um, observation one observation two, observation three, and observation four. The thing is though, in this case, there was nothing special about this observation one between this teacher and that nurse, right? There's nothing special here. It's just, hey, my first teacher I surveyed, my first nurse I surveyed, my second teacher, my second nurse. There's nothing linking these observations together, nothing making these two being paired together. Right, so big distinction happening there. In this case, they were independent. There was no reason I had to write it in this order. I very could have, I very well could have gone and said this guy was 820 and this guy was 845. Right? I could have switched those two with absolutely no loss, no impact whatsoever. Let's uh, let's make that a bit nicer. Right, I could have made that 845. That guy there, I could have made that 820, and there'd be no loss. No loss at all. In this case, I can't do so, right? Because in this case, these two values are linked to this house. These two values are linked to this house. I have paired observations. So in this case, because I have paired observations, this actually works out in our favor when we have dependent samples when this observation is paired to that observation, I actually am able to get a smaller standard errors than what I would have been able to get in my previous case, right? In my previous case with independent samples, I was adding my variances together. Variance of one plus variance of two. In my dependent sample, I don't, I don't have to do that. In my dependent sample, what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna create a new variable altogether, right? Instead of, hey, this is x1, this is x2, I'm gonna create a new variable, which I'll call lowercase delta. And lowercase delta is just gonna be the difference in my values. And I can write this then, my test statistic, as a t n delta, and that will be my delta bar, minus the average value of delta all over my sample standard deviation of delta root n. That is really, what we're doing is we're turning this into a one sample hypothesis test. We've done this before, right? We've done this before. We've just said tn, uh, sorry, tn minus one, this is n delta minus one, equals x bar minus mu all over the standard deviation of x all over root of n, right? And this is the mu of x, standard deviation of x. The only difference here, one sample, one sample, just instead of dealing with this x, I'm dealing with this new variable I'm calling delta. So where do I get this delta from? 
Well, I get this delta from how I've explicitly stated my null and alternative. And that is, I've stated in this case, mu1 minus mu2. So I would create my new variable delta as 1 minus 2. So that is, I could create that as 235 minus 228. So 7. 210 minus 205. 5. 231 minus 219, 12, right? I now have this new variable of three observations, and I could work out based off of that, hey, is this new variable here on average, is this guy any different than zero? That's essentially what I'm doing. Keep in mind, right, I kind of jumped the gun there. I started calculating things. Technically, we wouldn't really be doing this until step five. I just wanted to show you the idea behind it. So step four. Step four then, explicitly state our decision rule. Here we have our, not x bar, right? Here we have our delta bar. Delta bar will be normally distributed if x bar 1 would have been normally distributed and x bar 2 would have been normally distributed. That is, right, we'd have to throw in here an assumption um, such as, right, because we only have sample size of 3, we would have to assume real estate prices are normally distributed. If that assumption was there, then okay, x1 is normally distributed, x2 is normally distributed, their sample means x bar 1, x bar 2, each of those guys would then have its normal distribution around the true population mean. In the same way, delta bar will have its true normal distribution centered around what we believe to be that true delta mu, right, such that Delta mu in this case we're saying is less than or equal to zero. Okay, carrying on then. We need to standardize this. We are going to be standardizing it to a T2, right? T n minus one. We have three observations. Minus one is two. And we're looking for 5% rejection area such that this delta is greater than zero. So, okay, here's zero. We're looking for greater than zero. We're looking over here. Such that that guy there, that guy there is 5%. So to work that out then, we want to go to our table. We want to take a look at two degrees of freedom. We want to take a look at an alpha of 5%. So alpha 5%, two degrees of freedom. That gives us negative... 2.920. Sorry, not negative. Where did I get that from? We're to the right. That's going to be positive 2.920. So again, to explicitly state this, if our test statistic is greater than 2.920, we will reject our null else we will fail to reject. Of course, again, I could state this in terms of p-values. If my p-value is less than my significance level, 0 0.05, we will reject our null. And again, p-values for a t, these p-values would need to be calculated using a stat software, R or Excel for an example. Final thing to note, the way that I calculated delta, 1 minus 2, that was because of how I stated it in my null and alternative. If I had stated this guy in the opposite way, I would have calculated these guys as 2 minus 1, and the result is I would have put this tail on the left. So everything would have just been on the other side. Doesn't matter which one, as long as there's consistency throughout your question. So the idea there. Let's work out there. Well, let's work out our scenario. So we have five. Determine our decision rule. So, okay, for five, we have our new variable delta. 
which we have values of 7, 5, and 12. So 7, 5, and 12. I need to figure out what my delta bar is. Well, delta bar is just going to be the summation of delta all over my sample size, right? I'm just changing x to d. That's really all that it is. So summation in this case here, 7 plus 5 plus 12 is 24. 24 divided by 3 gives me a delta bar of 8. Okay. I then need to find out my sample standard deviation. So that's going to be delta minus delta bar squared. So 7 minus 8 squared. So 1 squared is 1. 5 minus 8 is negative 3. 3 squared is 9. 12 minus 8 is 4. 4 squared is 16. Take the summation of that. 1 and 9 is 10. 10 and 16 is 26. So my standard deviation of delta will be the summation of delta minus delta bar squared all over n minus 1. So 26, that's my delta minus delta bar divided by n minus 1, divided by 2. So 26 over 2, I get a standard deviation of delta of 13. Sorry, these are all squared. These are variances. This is variance, right? So I get a variance of delta of 13. I'm looking for my standard deviation. So take the square root of everything. Square root of 13, I get standard deviation of delta. There we go to be 3.6, I will go 0.5, uh, or rather 0.6, 0.555, so 606 is what we'll say our standard deviation is. Okay, I have delta bar, I have my sample standard deviation, I know my sample size, this is presumed based off of my null, I have everything I need to calculate this now. So to calculate it, let's go. My T2, right, n minus 1, is going to be sample mean minus 0 all over 3.606 root 3. So that's 8 over 8 over that guy there works out to be 3.84. Uh, 3.843. So based off of that, where does that fit? 3.843. That's going to be clearly out there. 3.843. That's in our rejection zone. So we would say, therefore, we reject the null. Okay, so in this video, what we've taken a look at is we've taken a look at our two sample hypothesis tests. We've stuck to our five steps of hypothesis testing, right? As promised, this is the big carry forward that will follow you to every following stats course. Two, uh, in our two sample hypothesis tests, we looked at what we do when we have independent samples, and that was for independent means, both sigma known and unknown, but presumed equal as well as independent proportions. We then finished off here taking a look at dependent samples, right? These dependent sample scenarios, this is what you would use if they're linked together, if you have paired observations. This is also what you could use for a before and after situation, right? So, hey, this group had this result before, they then had this result after, Right, individuals are paired before to after. Is there a difference on average between the before and after? Did they perform better after the uh, experiment happened than they did before it happened? Or right, something along those lines. So those situations happening here, four different new test statistics brought in, all fitting into our five steps of hypothesis testing. If you're lost on this, if you're confused, feel free, please reach out to me. 
The following video will just be purely examples. We'll probably go through at least one to two examples for each of these types. If you're still having problems, right, typically the problem with this is getting the alternative and the null in the right direction or in identifying the right test statistic. If you're having issues, if you're having difficulties with any of that, please feel free to reach out to me either through D2L or through email. Thanks.